My name is Nicolette McDonnell. I'm a nurse practitioner. I work at Foundation Medical Partners, which is part of Southern New Hampshire Health. I work with our breast surgeons in the surgery department, and we are a Massachusetts General Hospital affiliate. Today I'll be talking a little bit about breast cancer and certain risk factors for developing breast cancer uh, so that hopefully you're, you would be able to identify yourself if you are at increased risk. And we'll also talk about screening options and risk reduction strategies for at-risk women. So first I just want to give you a little bit of background on breast cancer. So next to skin cancer, breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer among women in the United States and it's the second leading cause of cancer death next to lung cancer. So to put this in numerical terms, a woman's lifetime risk of being diagnosed with breast cancer is about 1 in 8, or approximately 12%. Um, so that's a fairly common breast cancer, which is why we have screening mammograms available for early detection. And if you follow the different organizations, whether it's American Cancer Society or ASCO um, or the U.S. Services Preventative Task Force, all of these uh, organizations have varying recommendations for when a woman should begin their screening mammograms. Here at the foundation, we've reviewed all of this literature and all of the data, and we've come to the consensus that our recommendation is that all women at average risk risk should begin their screening mammograms between the ages of 40 and 45. So again, that recommendation is for average risk women, but there are factors that can affect this risk. So on this slide, on the left, um, are the modifiable risk factors. So these are the changeable things, so in lifestyle or behavior. Um, and so the first risk factor is prolonged hormone replacement therapy use, which is typically prescribed for menopausal symptoms such as hot flashes. So really, if a woman's going to be taking hormone replacement therapy, um, we typically recommend not taking it any longer than two years because we do know that prolonged estrogen exposure to the breast tissue is an increased risk factor for breast cancer. Obesity is also a risk factor. Exercise is actually a protective factor. So for women who exercise between four and seven hours a week at a moderate to intense level, that's protective of your breast tissue. Alcohol intake is a risk factor. So drinking greater than three drinks per week. Smoking is a risk factor. Breastfeeding, particularly if you breastfed your children for greater than one year, is actually a protective factor. And young age at first birth, so women who had their children in their early 20s compared to those that had their children in their 30s, um, is actually a protective factor. So those are, those are the things that you can change or modify in your life to help mitigate some of the risk. On the right, we have the non-modifiable risk factors, so the things that unfortunately we, we cannot change. And what I always tell women is that the two biggest risk factors for developing breast cancer are unfortunately the two that you can't control, which is your age, so getting older, and gender, being a woman. Race is also a risk factor, so we know that Caucasian or white women have a slightly elevated risk of developing breast cancer. We know that early menarche and late menopause are also risk factors, so starting your period earlier in life, typically before the age of 12, and going through menopause later, um, 55 years old or greater. If there's a family history of breast cancer, of course you're at elevated risk. If you received high-dose thoracic radiation, typically for Hodgkin's lymphoma treatment, between the ages of 10 and 30. If you've had a high-risk lesion seen on a previous breast biopsy, if you yourself have a personal history of breast cancer, you are at slightly elevated risk to, to develop a second future breast cancer. And lastly, having dense breast tissue. And this is a topic of increasing interest in the field regarding um, different types of imaging techniques that should be made available to women with dense breast tissue. So if we take a lot of that information from the previous slide for each individual, we do have a way that we can quantify the lifetime risk for each specific person. Um, so we've got risk models. They're listed here, the most commonly used models, to include the Gale model, Tyra Cusick, and BRCA Pro. And the current recommendation is that if, based on these risk models, the lifetime risk is greater than 20%, this is considered high risk, and additional screening and or risk reduction strategies should really be considered. So of the risk factors we talked about earlier, who are the highest risk groups? So the first are those that carry genetic mutations. The second is those that have a strong family history 
of breast cancers, but we've done genetic testing and we haven't been able to identify a known mutation. The third group are those that had thoracic radiation, again, delivered under the age of 30. And lastly, women who have had high-risk histology on a previous breast biopsy, and we'll go into a little bit more detail regarding each of these categories. So women who have had a known genetic mutation. Oftentimes, this is the highest risk population. The BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes are the most well-known breast cancer genes and confer a lifetime risk of breast cancer up to 87%, which is pretty remarkable compared to that 12.5% or so of the average risk women. Angelina Jolie is somebody who carries one of these mutations and brought a lot of media attention to it because she did have her risk-reducing surgeries where she had a double mastectomy and had her ovaries and fallopian tubes removed. Um, so that garnered some attention and people are a little bit more aware of it. In addition to the BRCA1 and 2 genes, we also do have multi-gene panel testing available where we can look at other genes that we know contribute to breast cancer risk. But it is important to know that different genes are associated with different risk profiles and your individualized screening and risk reduction recommendations may differ for each. So who should be tested? I see a lot of women that request genetic testing even in the absence of family history, um, but it's important to know that not all women meet criteria for genetic testing. Um, this slide is comprised of what we consider the red flags for genetic testing. So if you or a first or second degree relative meet any of these criteria, we certainly recommend that you at least meet with a genetic counselor or a breast specialist to discuss testing. So if you or a family member was diagnosed with breast cancer under the age of 45, if you or a family member had ovarian cancer at any age, or two primary breast cancers. So when I say that, we don't mean necessarily having a breast cancer recurrence, but we mean two separate tumors or two different types of breast cancers. For example, having bilateral breast cancer. Male breast cancer diagnosed at any age. If you had a triple negative breast cancer that was diagnosed under the age of 60, if you're of the Ashkenazi Jewish population um, and you have a personal or family history of either breast or ovarian cancer, you should be tested. If you see multiple associated cancers on the same side of the family, so these would include breast, ovarian, pancreatic, and prostate cancers, um, you should certainly meet with a genetic counselor. And lastly, of course, if there's been a previously identified mutation in a close family member, your risk of carrying a mutation is significantly elevated compared to just the, you know, random average woman. So you should certainly meet with a breast specialist or a genetic counselor. The next group of high-risk women are those that have a very strong family history, but we've done genetic testing and there's no known mutation that we've been able to find. Um, and so there's a common misconception that if a woman undergoes testing because of her strong family history and tests negative, that she's right back down to the average population risk. And that's not actually the case because we do know that there are some, that there are some environmental factors that contribute to breast cancer or some biologic components that we just don't have the capacity to test for. And so we don't just dismiss these women back into the average population. This is where our risk models can become very helpful in terms of guiding recommendations for screening and risk reduction. The next group of high-risk women are those that received thoracic radiation, again, typically for treatment of Hodgkin's lymphoma. The risk is greatest when the radiation is delivered between the ages of 10 and 30 because this is when the breast tissue is still developing and considered vulnerable to the effects of radiation therapy. We do know that the breast cancer risk begins to increase at about 10 years after radiation exposure and increased screening should be considered at this time. And certainly these women should be followed closely by a breast specialist. The next group of high-risk women are those who have had a high-risk lesion that was seen on a prior breast biopsy. So the high-risk lesions are listed below and include lobular carcinoma in situ, atypical lobular hyperplasia, and atypical ductal hyperplasia. So if you had any of these lesions that was seen on a prior breast biopsy, um, your lifetime risk, or excuse me, the risk for the next 10 to 25 years is about 21 to 35 percent. So again, this is elevated compared to that 12 and a half percent risk, and we should certainly consider increased screening for you. 
So if you're viewing this presentation and you think you're high risk or you've already seen a breast health provider and you've been identified as high risk, we need to have options for you. So the first option is increased screening. So in addition to getting an annual mammogram, we would recommend MRI screening. Uh, the benefit of getting a breast MRI is that it's a very sensitive screening tool. And what I mean by that is that if there is an invasive breast cancer present, it detects it about 99% of the time, which is pretty remarkable. The drawback is that because MRIs are so sensitive, it is a study that has what we call a high false positive rate. So essentially, little things can enhance in the breast that may be nothing, uh, but we certainly can't ignore them. So these findings may lead to unnecessary biopsies and additional imaging. Additionally, MRIs also do not always detect early stage breast cancers, which is why uh, annual mammograms are still recommended, which can in fact detect the earliest breast cancers, often considered stage zero breast cancers. So that's the screening component. The next component is actual, actually a medical approach. So um, there are oral medications. Uh, the most common is called tamoxifen. It's a medication that we actually not only give for breast cancer treatment, but also breast cancer prevention. So this is an oral medication that would be taken daily for five years. And in women who successfully complete the recommended course, it's been shown in studies to decrease the lifetime risk by up to 50%, which is pretty remarkable. Lastly, we have the preventative surgery option. So this is when we talk about performing a double mastectomy, again, solely preve for preventative purposes. And we do know that this can reduce the breast cancer risk to approximately 1%. So for example, if a woman with a known BRCA mutation comes in, she doesn't have a personal history of breast cancer, but just has the mutation, her lifetime risk of developing breast cancer is as high as 87%. But if we perform the preventative surgery, we can reduce her risk to about 1%. This is typically reserved for patients that have a known mutation. However, we do sometimes do this surgery on patients who have no identified mutation but just have a very compelling and strong family history. So if after listening to this presentation you think that you may be at increased breast cancer risk or even if you're not sure and just want to learn a little bit more about your risks, please feel free to reach out to me. Again, I'm located at Foundation Surgery, um, a part of Southern New Hampshire Health. I can be reached at 603-882-8375. You can request an appointment with me. Alternatively, you can also ask your PCP or gynecologist to put in a referral for you and they can help to arrange the appointment. So I hope this presentation was helpful and informative for you and I thank you for listening.